Okay, so this is session eight. That's Gita chapter six. So um, I wanted to just quickly recap. You know, we've kind of uh, wrapped up Karma Yoga, and I'm not sure if any of you have read the second chapter of my first book. It kind of summarizes everything. So it's nice to go back to the summary of the Gita as we transition. So you know, there are four yogas in uh, the Gita. Uh, the first yoga is Karma Yoga. The second is Raj Yoga, which is chapter six, and then you have Bhakti Yoga, which is from chapters seven, kind of from seven onwards till twelve. Um, <clears throat> now Raj Yoga and Bhakti Yoga, they are together called uh, Upasana in Vedic terms, um, and Upasana is further under the category of Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga. So in, in, in the Vedas, you know, you have the Karma Kand and you have the Gyan Kand, essentially. Or you have the Karma Kand, Upasana Kand and the Gyan Kand. But uh, in, in Gita, you have four. You know, Karma Yoga, Raj Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Gyan Yoga. So we are transitioning from Karma Yoga to, Upasana, uh, to Raj Yoga. Now, Raj Yoga is... Um, where you have all the um, the spiritual practices, the techniques. Uh, actually, that is chapter. Uh, which chapter is that of mine? I think chapter four. I think yeah. I think chapter four of my book, of my first book, that I have covered. Uh, that is basically I have covered radio, all the techniques and everything of my first book. I think it's online. Uh, I didn't read it again, actually. Today I was thinking of reading it in case I find some points. Let me see if I can pull it up. So, Raj Yoga is where you have all the spiritual uh, techniques, uh, which includes uh, all the physical yogas, the pranayams, uh, meditation, Kriya Yoga, um, all of those things. Even though Chapter 6 is only about meditation, um, because in in the Gita it is only um, it only sort of uh, refers to the breath the prana pranayam very briefly. Um, it was in the in those times the the kriya the pranayams they were not so uh, pronounced so to say they were not so prominent in practice. The main practice was to prepare for meditation so everything sort of leads up to meditation so the asanas were really for the yogi to prepare his body for meditation the pranayams are also for the yogi to prepare the yogi for meditation but everything sort of was a preparatory step for meditation and so um, this chapter chapter six uh, solely talks about meditation itself um, and uh, um, so the prerequisite for meditation is then karma yoga. So now you see karma yoga, um, you know, you, you, we've covered karma yoga. And so it's essentially, you know, the, the reduction of your, of your thoughts. So if you have a very, um, if you have a, a mind which is driven by a lot of thoughts, thoughts which are driven by desires, desires which come from ego, if all of this chain thing is happening and your mind is so preoccupied, um, you are not really prepared for meditation. And a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, there's a prerequisite for meditation. So meditation, yes, you can meditate, but it will not really give you the results or you, you will never attain the fruit of meditation if you have not done the prerequisite. Um, so, essentially, when your vasanas, your mind's mind is not driven by vasanas and desires um, that much, of course, it, they'll still be there. But say if you have your vasanas are, say, at 100%, right? Now, if you remove the vasanas, your, your thoughts, which are driven by desires, by ego, and your vasanas, your impressions, by say 25%. At that point, yes, you should start meditating. But if you see people or even if you see yourself, if you go back and see how you've evolved and you see how other people have evolved, 
A man or person doesn't naturally become inclined towards meditation or is not very effective at meditation or doesn't get anything out of meditation, a one who is very extrovertish. Um, so the, the natural uh, evolution of our soul growth or our human evolution, we naturally go from the outside to the inside when our outward looking um, extrovertish attitude uh, comes to a certain um, detachment. We sort of start moving towards the inside. But a person who's very extrovertish, who's very driven um, and cannot ever see anything beyond that, that person cannot really meditate or get anything out of meditation. So that is not to say that you cannot be externally focused and internally focused. It's not that. What I'm saying is that a person who cannot see beyond a, a three-dimensional kind of living where it's objects, it's about attachments, it's about uh, you know solely material desires and so forth, that kind of person can never be drawn by anything subtle, even if it's their own feelings. So they would never recognize that you know, they, they may feel irritated or anxious or they may, may even have depression or they may have something within themselves which the other person recognizes but they are unable to recognize because they never look inside. But a person who has started becoming aware of their inner feelings and inner thoughts and has sort of... Um, increased or expanded their awareness from just the physical plane to more of the subtle plane also at that point yes you can uh, say yes your you know the ground is prepared for meditation so in the gita it talks about karma yoga to in order to for you to kind of reduce your worldly desires and your you know your impression driven actions and so forth it's the preparatory step is karma yoga and most people are really at that point in in their evolution um, it are that they are in the karma yoga phase very few are really uh, have really gone and pondered within or started pondering within um, so the other thing is what even the gita in chapter 6 says is that you see it's not that this transition from karma yoga the mat mature, you know, the ma the evolution or the maturing of um, of a soul of a jeev uh, has to happen in one lifetime. Okay, so it's it's a uh, evolution over lifetimes. So think of the lifetime of a jeev of a soul, individual soul. Don't think of it as just happening within your lifetime as you as you are today. Okay, so think of you, the jeev not you the personality whatever your name and body is but the jeev that that individual soul that is within you you think of that as your true you know ident i mean uh, identity or sort of that is who you are right now is a is a jeev is an individual soul that has lived many lives and so like that you are moving from lifetime to lifetime it's like moving from you know class one to class two to you know whatever grade one to grade two to grade three um, so you are evolving right you're going one grade higher one grade higher so chapter six is like you know you're in in grade six now right sixth grade and so this doesn't happen necessarily in one life so wherever you have left off in your previous life i'm just being simplistic here but wherever you have left off in your previous life is where you will pick up in the next life. So some souls have kind of left off, say, in Bhakti Yoga. They, they may be born again and they, they may start briefly in Bhakti Yoga, but they will proceed if they grow and if they evolve, they'll pr proceed to Gyan Yoga. And actually the, the, there are uh, verses in, in this chapter that talk about it. Um, let me see which uh, which verses those are and mark them but it it's not something that i'm going off topic i wanted you to uh, because Krish, uh, actually arjun asked Sri krishna this question yeah verses 41 and 42 actually refer to those what i'm saying so wherever you leave off you you know you kind of start off um in the next life so 
the evolution has gone now from Karmyog into Rajyog. And uh, what the next question comes is what is meditation, right? So meditation is a widely used term in the West. The, the Sanskrit name for it is uh, Dhyan, which is used here in the Gita. In uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, it's, you know, uh, there's uh, Dhara Dhyana and Samadhi. So here, actually, in the, in the Gita, I don't want to confuse you too much, but basically, chapter 6 talks about both Dhyana and Samadhi of the Patanjali uh, Sutras, you know, the eight limbs, if you want to kind of correlate. But Dhyana in the classical terms, in, in the Gita, <clears throat> is really the samadhi that you will find in Patanjali. It's the final merger. It's the, it's the merging of the mind into pure consciousness through single-pointed meditation or single-pointed concentration or whatever it is. So, dhar, dhyan and samadhi combined here in the Gita is called dhyan. Okay? So, meditation is the merging of the mind into pure consciousness. And uh, and here it talks about the method as well. So from uh, verses 11 onward, Sri Krishna is saying, you know, uh, take a seat which is not too high or not too low and then, you know, put, uh, put first a cloth and a skin and then the kusha grass and then you sit on it with your spine erect and put your concentration at the tip of your nose and you start breathing and then you focus and da da da. And he goes through all these steps of meditation. It's incredible, but it's like step by step. You know, he gives these instructions of how you should me meditate. Um, and, um, and, and actually before that, you know, he, he actually is given the pre he gives all the prerequisites for uh, before you start meditating, you know, how you, like I said, the karma yoga aspect. Um, there are a few verses here that, that I really like uh, in this chapter. I really like this chapter anyway, but there are some things which are very deep. Like there is a verse number five, and it's a very popular verse. Um, it talks about how you you lift yourself by your own self, by your lower self. Okay, and and you your mind is a friend. It can be a friend to you, or it can be your enemy. So there are two parts to it. So the first part says you lift yourself by yourself, okay? It can be a little confusing, but essentially what that means is that, see, you, you have your body, mind, intellect, uh, memory, ego, and self, right? The, now, in the, in the Gita, when the self with the, uh, with the uppercase S is used, that refers to your Atma. In English, whenever you see the uppercase self, that refers to your Atma. When it's lowercase self, that is your lower self, your mind-body complex, your intellect, mind and body complex, right? So what it's saying here is, is very, very important. How can you reach your true self, your higher self, your Atma? When you are identified or when you are existing from a lower uh, identity of yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? So here you are, you know, you're kind of functioning from your lower identity, right? Now, how is it that you can um, move from this lower functioning, lower awareness that you have of yourself, which it, most of the time, if you realize, we operate from the mind and intellect level. So how do you move from where you are to the next level when you're not even there yet. So here in this verse it says you lift yourself by yourself using your mind and intellect only. Because the mind and intellect when it's purified it can be used as a tool to go to the other side. The other side meaning your Atma. So it's like, you know, you are, I'd mentioned this once before, it's like, you know, you're standing on the threshold or, you know, sort of at the, um, uh, what you call it, uh, the doorway, 
you're standing on the doorway okay of your house now outside is this infinite universe just imagine it like a you know like a sci-fi movie or a, a sort of a animation so now imagine yourself standing at the doorway behind you is your house you know your house meaning your body your mind your your you know your physical existence your subtle existence and your causal existence that is the house so behind you is the house now you're looking outside and outside is this gigantic infinite universe and there's galaxies and you look below your feet there's nothing there except infinity you look in front of you there's nothing but infinity how do you plunge into that infinite consciousness into that infinite space how do you take that plunge? So on one side is this infinite consciousness, your self, your higher self. And on the other side is your lower self. And you are on the threshold. Now, using that mind, intellect, memory and your jeev, your entire thing, that itself can plunge you into the infinite. That Using that itself, you can plunge into the infinite do, do you understand because there is no other means that is available to you at that point when you are inside the house you're on the threshold and using your mind and intellect so the mind and intellect can either make you inward facing or outward facing it's a tool you know the mind and intellect is sort of the threshold so it can either make you focus on the lower awareness, on your lower self, or the mind and intellect can be used to contemplate and use that as a tool for contemplation, use that as a tool to prepare you for that infinite. So the mind and intellect here in this chapter is preparing you for meditation. And that's how he says, you know, how you use you you only use the mind to get rid of the thoughts you only, how because when the intellect says when the intellect overrules the mind you can reduce the number of thoughts you can reduce the number of asanas you can reduce the desires you use the intellect to purify the mind you use the and you you know you whatever knowledge or gyan or whatever you want to do to purify the intellect you use that to purify the intellect and when the intellect realizes that this is where I want to merge into, you have to have tremendous faith and be incredibly, incredibly fearless to sort of take your ego to extinction and plunge it into that infinity. So here in this chapter also it says, you know, basically where you where the ego sort of plunges itself or the intellect plunges itself into infinity and merges with that infinite consciousness that you are um, so that is it that is an experience that is beyond the mind it's beyond the intellect are, are you with me so far everyone Yes, please. Very much. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting. You see, um, you take your mind as, use that mind as a tool to a certain point. And then after that certain point, it's surrender. You simply have to surrender. And for that surrender to happen, you have to be fearless. And you can only be fearless if you have faith. So... I can tell you from my experience, you know, when, when you get into a very advanced stage of meditation, the ego does not want to be exterminated. That ego wants to hold on to its identity. It's, it doesn't want, um, it, it, it wants to remain. And so there is a fear because the, the ego fears that, that death. And so when you listen to the Katha Upanishad um, and you listen, uh, let me see one second. Huh, Katha Upanishad. You know where, uh, what's his name? Oh, gosh. You know where he goes to Yama, right? Uh, Nachiket. 
and he dies. Correct? Uh, I don't know how many of you know. Uh, so in the Katha Upanishad, Nachiket, you know, he dies and he meets Yama, the lord of the dead. So it's not that he died. It's actually symbolic for that his ego died. Okay? And so the the death of the ego is is something that has to happen for you to experience the merger. And um, it's, it's a very... Um, it's a very, uh, what should I say, it's a, uh, once you do it, you know, once you go beyond and you experience it, then after that there's no fear. It's only the fear for the first time. So when you, when you plunge into that infinite consciousness and bliss, then the other verses here describe what it's like, you know, the, the experience of that infinite bliss of the self. When you witness the self, when you merge with the self, how that experience, once you have it, you will never forget it, ever. And that will keep bringing you back to the center. And once you are established in that center, nothing will affect you. Nothing will affect you. Because once you are anchored in that, you become like the center of the wheel. The center of the wheel doesn't turn. Everything else is turning, but the center of the wheel is not turning. Turning. Here in this, in this chapter, it mentions the anvil. You know how when you, a blacksmith hits on something, you, no matter, matter how much you are hit upon, whether it's your emotions that are hit upon, the body is hit upon, the mind is hit upon, but the anvil never gets affected. Everything is hit upon. So you don't get affected by, you know, you know when you have that awareness of that self, when you have experienced that infinite bliss, and you know that this is truly who you are, that, you know, that you're basically eternal. You can never die. I mean, and you realize that that is your higher self, that's the true self. Then you don't get affected by, you know, whether you're sick or healthy or uh, on in the body level, whether you have pleasure or pain on the mind level. Um, I mentioned other things here about the how, you know, the, your intellect will never, you know, may swing between here and there. But you will never get affected by all these things that are happening outside. You know, if somebody insults you or you get sick or whatever happens, you know, so, so, sorrow and grief. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it is understood. So the question, I think, is how do we get to that stage? Is it through the practices or yes. like, what is the journey we have to go through? Yeah. So that's exactly what Arjun asks uh, Shri Krishna actually. You, 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 you are like Arjun. <laughs> So what happens is that, you know, after Krishnaji uh, describes all these things, um, uh, Arjun asks, okay, so I'm not there yet, <laughs> how, how do I achieve this? And uh, so, he, you know, Sri Krishna says, it's okay, you know, keep practicing it, keep becoming more dispassionate, lose your attachments, lose your attachments and keep practicing and slowly that purification will happen and slowly you will achieve it. So the main thing what Sri Krishna is saying is you have to have the intention. And anybody who has that intention of experiencing it will experience it in time with practice. Um, and the practice he's already described. He's, he's told you the prerequisites which is karma yoga and all these other things I told you. He gives the technique of meditation, how to sit, how to focus, what is there. And he also tells you the experience that you will have and how the mind quietens down. You know, if you read the verses, it'll tell you step by step. Then after that, the mind quietens down and then using the mind and the intellect, you use that to plunge you into that infinite. And if the mind wanders, bring it back and again and again. All this is mentioned there. The whole meditation thing is mentioned there. And then... Once you experience that, you will never lose the, um, you will never lose that experience. You will keep building on it. And, uh, and then he says, okay, so what if I fail? Will I, am I destined to be, uh, to be, you know, destroyed or something? And then that's what Sri Krishna says. No, 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 no. If you don't achieve it in this life, you will be born in the next life and you'll start off from wherever you left off. So the method is given to you. It's a simply a matter of practice. 
everything is given to you okay and um, um, where was I now um, I've forgotten um, yeah so one thing that uh, was, was very interesting to me was you mentioned that, you know, using your intellect to quiet on your mind, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, using the knowledge that you have to sharpen your intellect, right? So this, I, I thought this was interesting, you know, kind of circular dependency between mind and intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, using one to improve the other. No, no, it's not. So, you know, the in if you go back to the Tattva Bodh chart, the mind is simply your thoughts and perception. And above the mind is the intellect. So, um, in your sort of uh, hierarchy, uh, you have your body, then your mind, and then your intellect. So, it's mind over body, it's mind over body, and it's intellect over mind. Okay? And usually what happens is our intellect is is driven by the ego usually or or memory memory meaning vasanas so usually what happens is that our ego or our vasanas or you know whatever past memory impressions we have that drives the intellect but you can purify that you can purify you can you know using karma yoga using knowledge so the intellect is purified by knowledge got it so when you say knowledge, knowledge, knowledge of the self, is, knowledge of that, your being, that kind of knowledge. Right. And that knowledge, we don't have to link that to mind. Sorry? It's just our understanding of knowledge. This knowledge, mm -hmm. we don't have to link that to the, this is our understanding of the knowledge or to purify our, our intellect. Okay. Yeah, so you know how in chapters 4 and 5 he keeps talking about how knowledge is the highest and renounce your actions into knowledge and so forth. Um, basically, it's, it's that knowledge means knowledge of the self. Knowledge meaning like what you're doing now, uh, learning the Gita. That kind of knowledge, you know, knowledge of your true self, knowledge about who you really are, what is your real um, nature um, and so forth. So the highest knowledge which is wisdom right that purifies the intellect so it kind of moves it from being ego driven to being uh, being driven from the higher self so when when you gain that knowledge it it uh, when you gain that knowledge then then it it is a tool by which you can use your wisdom um, basically, wisdom is only in the intellect only, right? I mean, wisdom is, it's, uh, it's a sort of a function of the intellect. Um, knowledge is a function of the intellect. So you can use that intellect to uh, merge into your higher self. That's what it's saying, essentially. So, so... This knowledge, first you read about what your nature is, what your true nature is, you ponder upon it, and you can use that as a sort of a meditation or whatever you want to do. To Once you gain that, um, that will also give you an intention to merge with yourself. You know, it's because you know that true nature and you want to experience it, that's when you use that uh, that knowledge to actually go from knowing to experience. So, um, okay, so yeah, verses, you know, from 11 to 26 really talk about uh, uh, the meditation. Um, and I said, like I said, you know, verse number five and few other verses here about how you use your lower self for your higher self. Very interesting. It's very interesting how it says your mind can be your best friend or it can be your worst enemy. Because, you know, an impure mind is your enemy. A purified mind is your friend because it helps you deal with um, pain or pleasure. You know, when the mind is purified... 
it is your friend it will help you so obviously ignorance is, uh, wisdom is better than ignorance i mean very simply or put uh, so it depends how you use your um how you use your uh, um, not instruments but how do you use your uh, you know uh, what should i say uh, not it, uh different aspects of yourself how do you use your body how do you use your mind because in everything you can make a choice how do you uh how do you act how do you think everything is a choice so you can make wise choices or you can make ignorant choices it's up to you you can wake up in the morning and say it's going to be a terrible day or i'm feeling horrible and have negativity or you can have a positive attitude because essentially the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the mind and intellect so um your mind and intellect can be your best friend or it can be your worst enemy um uh question what are the qualities of an impure mind qualities of a impure mind is all these negativities you know likes and dislikes anger attachment all the negative feelings you have negative thoughts you have um you have jealousy you have greed lust anger all of these things are a negative mind right yeah but how do you how do you control those negative uh, um a negative mind like a anger or jealousy or whatever uh, impurity you have gita doesn't tell us how to do that it tells us how to do meditation but how to achieve the pure mind yeah it does actually so what happens is how how do you get impurity the impurity is the original cause is ignorance first number 1 that from that comes your ego and because of your ego then you have all of these wrong actions and um you know wrong thinking and because of that see it's it's like okay i'll tell you something like supposing you have a pattern to think in a particular way okay supposing somebody is always thinking negative you know that it's a, it's a pessimistic person now how do you become optimistic how, how do you change your thought patterns it is up to you first of all it starts with intention now to become a positive person you have to purify the mind purifying the mind you have to use your intellect now if a person has these patterns in the mind where they are always pessimistic they have to use the intellect saying saying no this is wrong the first thing you have to do is stop yourself from those chain of thoughts so you have to use your intellect and say no this is wrong and at that point you have to choose what to think because you do have a choice of what you think but unless you use your intellect of right and wrong and what is correct and talk to yourself you know and talk to your mind using your intellect intellect meaning all the reasonings that you do all the wisdom that you use that this is why you use all this knowledge to change your thought patterns all this knowledge and wisdom that you gain is simply to change your thought patterns and that is exactly what is vasanas vasanas means you always run down the wrong patterns and how do you change those patterns and create new ones so tell me if there is any other way to do it but there is no other way so it is mind that creates problems in the body because your mind thinks certain ways it is only wise thinking through the intellect that can tell the mind no this is wrong i should not think negative of negative outcomes that oh there's something wrong with my body oh this is this this is wrong this is bad and look at bad intentions of people or always gravitate towards the negative or whatever because the mind will always chase after the negative that's the nature of the mind it is only by using your wisdom through the intellect that you can conquer the mind and the intellect is purified by wisdom by knowledge there is no other way 
There is nothing else that is available to you to change your thought patterns. Do you agree? Correct. It's choices of how you want to think. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 so you see the Vedic uh, knowledge is very scientific. You know, it's very scientific. It goes step by step. It doesn't. You know, like how we just make general statements. There. You know, it's not very. It's not fuzzy. You know, it breaks it down. It says, see. Body is controlled by the senses, controlled by our perception, which is our thoughts, and thoughts are controlled by the intellect. Intellect is controlled by the memory of asanas. Asanas are controlled by the ego. Blah blah blah. So it's very very scientific. You know, it's almost like biology. So it it is um, it is telling you what instruments are available to you, and which knob to turn. If you turn this knob. See, it's like a watch. You know, when you open a watch, or there's all these wheels. So think of it like these wheels. You turn one wheel, the other wheel will turn because they're all interlinked. So it's saying just go to the highest wheel. See, a lot of people do yoga asanas. Fine, you do yoga asanas, but that itself is not going to change your entire existence. Your existence has many interlocking wheels. So it's saying that you go to the highest, you know, top-down approach. So you just make sure you you are uh, you are anchored into your center, which is your atma. Once you are centered in the atma, and you function from that atma, it'll it's trickle down. Then everything will flow. Now, yes, you 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 know you you can go bottom up from body, and then you try da 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 da. But you see, they have realized the body is controlled by the mind, mind is controlled by the intellect, and they have already know all of this stuff. So now you know people are talking about this, and they're realizing it from uh, trial and error. How from their personal experiences, a lot of new age spirituality and masters. Are experiencing this from trial and error, but these rishis through their trial and error discovered this ages ago. They have already gone through these uh, mileposts, and they're telling you all this knowledge. So you might as well uh, read up on what they <laughs> learnt and experienced, and trust it. And uh, and so um, basically. It is telling you that the final or the best solution, the final solution, because see, we always find temporary solutions in life, right? We'll find temporary solutions for the body. We'll find temporary solutions for the mind, for the emotions, for this intellect, da 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 da. But the the Gita and the Vedas give you the final solution. Just merge into your pure self, into pure consciousness. Just merge. Then nothing. You don't need anything else. You don't need these temporary solutions. It's giving you the permanent solution. Just go for that. And so this is what what meditation is all about: merging into that pure consciousness. So yeah, it it also talks about you know that's why it puts meditation as the highest. And and Sri Krishna in one of the concluded concluding verses he says. A meditator is better than a tapasvi of self-denial. You see, a, a person who just uh, does certain rituals or does this uh, tapasvi, you know, who renounces everything that I will sit on, I, I'll sleep on the floor, I'll deny myself of food and clothing and all that stuff. Just uh, doing that itself has no value until and unless you really experience. That meditation, the meditation of merger. So he says, meditation is better than a tapasvi, just a simple tapasvi who is doing all of these things. And if you remember the life of Buddha, Buddha spent many years doing tapasya. You know, many years he almost died, and then he sat for meditation that night. If you remember that night, full moon night. So that is when he experienced his self. But he was a tapasvi for many years. And he says, 
that a meditator is better than a jnani, a scholar. Because see, simply you are a professor then. If you just learn up on everything and if you are very good at it, that's fine. But basically you have not achieved the... Um, what the knowledge, the subject is of that knowledge. So he's saying that a meditator is better than a jnani, a scholar or a professor who is just well versed in, in this thing and has a lot of knowledge but has not ever experienced anything. And a meditator is be better than a just a simple karma yogi who it's good as a preparatory stage. You see, karma yoga is a good as a preparatory stage, but meditation is higher because it is actually you have done karma yoga to prepare yourself for meditation not that you give up karma yoga you add to it you don't stop at karma yoga give it up and then you start meditating now you've added to your karma yoga so you continue because you see a medita a person who has truly merged with his self he will continue to serve and love everybody and it's very beautiful, you know, these verses where, verses 27 to 32, if you read, it's such beautiful description of this yogi who has achieved that merger where he sees himself in everything. Because, you know, when you experience that oneness, that merger, it is not just your atma. It is the, it is, you, you basically have gone to this oneness, you know, you, it's, everything is, is, is consciousness. So, you see everything like an ocean of consciousness, you know, you see nothing but consciousness. It, it is like one living being, you know, it's like, um, how should I say, you know, like uh, supposing you're like inside a body, right, you... You know, that whole body, uh, now body, the human body, just think of it like a creation, right? Now, whole creation is like a human body. It's a living being. It's not inanimate objects around you. Everything is consciousness. And when you experience that bliss, it's like one huge body, one huge being, living being. And everything is body, right? When... When you look at the human body, it's not uh, separate things. Even though, you know, you have different organs, you have the blood, you have this, you have so many millions and billions of cells, but it's one. It, it's one body. So like that, when you experience this merger, everything is just one. You know, uh, I, I hope, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say, but it seems like you're in this being, which is everything is one and everybody's one and you look at somebody, it is nothing but yourself. But another uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know how uh, you would take uh, uh, like clay or water or uh, say some gel. Now from an ocean of gel, you will pick up and make one body. And from that same gel, you will pick up and make another figure. But basically they are of that same substance, you know what I am saying? So you would see everybody just uh, like you would have two puppets on your hand, you know, one puppet on one hand, one puppet on the other hand and these two puppets are there, right? But essentially it's your right hand and your left hand. It's not two separate bodies, not two separate uh, people, I mean entities. It's, it's the greater whole is the same entity. So when you look at the other person, it's almost like you're looking at the other hand, your other hand. I mean, you are one hand, the other person is the other hand, but you know it's, it's the same thing. It's the same being. So, you know, he describes how this yogi will see oneness. He will see himself in everything and everything in himself because he has that uh, unlimited awareness now, you know. Even though you function through this center and within your body, your awareness is everywhere. Non-locality, it's in quantum physics, is called non-locality. It's the, it's the connectiveness of all things. Do any of you know quantum physics? Guruji, 
she talks about it. She talks about it. She talks about it. Yeah, so it's the non locality of things, it's the interconnectedness of everything. See, like in a human body, everything is connected to everything, right? It's like that, you know, when you, when you have that infinite awareness, you'll understand that everything is connected to everything else. So, okay, so that's, let me just check my notes. Any questions? Can I have is, does such a person... Whoa, one sec. Hold on. Seema, go ahead. Does, 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 does. Okay, I'm getting an echo, but okay, so let's try. Can you? I think it's your, it's your, uh, Seema, I think it's your laptop. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat your question. Go ahead. Gary, that's take throughout the whole Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, um, uh, okay, it's, it's not a subject of the Gita, so let me just, uh, this is not anywhere in the Gita, so I don't like to give, you know, when I cover a text, I want to stay in. <laughs> within the text but basically what happens it's 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 um it's not uh, that it happens uh, 24/7 uh, immediately okay uh, what happens is you you will have that awareness initially temporarily um, it's like an opening you might have a flash maybe once in a lifetime maybe a few times in a lifetime then those windows will become a little bit bigger and you might have it a little bit more and then it'll stay a little bit more and so it keeps increasing and then it may be more than 50% of the time you can be in that state or it can be at will where you can say okay I want to be at this and yes it is possible to go to a level where you are in it uh, most of the time uh, there are few that are in it 100% of the time. I mean, I mean, of course, I don't know. But yes, absolutely, uh, it's rare. It's not uh, common. But you can definitely achieve the level where uh, you operate from that awareness 100% of the time. Most people find it difficult to operate in this world sometimes you know because you can basically not sleep uh, you will have no sleep and it's a little difficult so some at will you can say okay i'll i'll come down to this level or so forth but that's a little bit off topic but yes you can operate from that 24 7 um, at a certain point you can choose at will but not everybody gets to choose at will Usually what happens is as the purification happens, those experiences will start increasing. And not just that these experiences start increasing, but the, 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 time, the amount of time that they last for will be longer and longer and so forth. But uh, yeah. Uh, someone was asking a question. This is Nayana. I wanted to ask you, why did you call this four yo uh, yoga that has been described in Gita Karma Yoga? You mentioned second as a Raja Yoga for this chapter six. Yes. Why did you call it a Raja Yoga and not the uh, Upasana? Like meditation Yoga or something? Huh? No, because you know, that is what uh, it's not my choice. It's not what I called it, but this is what all the teachers before me have called it. Yeah, so if you pick up any uh, uh, of the teachers, uh, the gurus or masters, uh, they have called this as Raj Yoga. Mm. And you'll you'll see you'll see why in the seventh chapter. Oh, okay. Yeah, it mentions why this is uh, this is called the Raj Yoga.
Thank you. Yep. Okay, I was actually going to lead a meditation, but we don't have time. It's 7.54. But it would be very nice. How many of you do not meditate? Everybody meditates? At some level. <laughs> yes, Yankar. Okay. That's some. So it's nice to meditate, but it's also good to be meditative. And what I mean by meditative is being, um, having that awareness um, as you walking, talking, working, because what happens then is that you will not get disturbed, you know, uh, that easily by situations or what people say. So if you, if you're, if you, um, if you, if you center or anchor yourself uh, deliberately, again using your intellect, using your mind and intellect. And you say, I'm going, so you tell, you're, it's a self-talk, you know, I, I'm going to uh, anchor myself in that awareness as I talk to my co-workers, as I talk to my relatives or my friends, so that if something comes at me, I am ready to respond in a uh, beneficial way and not react. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? So... It's good to meditate, but you know, a lot of people meditate and the moment they come out of meditation or even while they're meditating, they can get annoyed or angry and you know, they're back to square one. I mean, first of all, they haven't done the purification. They haven't done the pre prerequisites. Like I said, many people start meditating without any purification. It's, you know, angry person should not meditate. I'm not saying it like this. This is, this is Shastra has said it. People who are get so angry, you will aggravate that anger if you because you're increasing the energy of that anger. So you need to not saying that you never get angry. Reduce that a little bit, you know, like if it's this much, at least reduce it 25%, you know, then start meditating. So you need to keep purifying and meditating, purifying, meditating. So it's not that you'll get to 100% and then you start meditation. It, you'll never achieve that. But what the compromise is you purify at least 25% and then you start meditating. But it is very important that we, of course, we sit and meditate like it says here, but it also says to keep yourself at the center, to be anchored into your center. So that is meditativeness, to be aware as you're going through the day because, see, problems will never go away, misery will never go away. So you have to know how to respond to it, right? So that's why it's very important to be meditative as well throughout the day. I had one question on uh, the state of uh, meditative. Um, a couple of times I noticed at work, you know, uh, when people are talking or, or in meetings, um, I try to do that. Observe what people are saying. Why are they saying? What intentions they're saying? Mm -hmm. And a couple of times, I noticed that you know, um, I wasn't sure if I'm going into that state or, or you know, I didn't want to risk myself seeming as someone who's zoning out. Right? And then I had to like snap out and, and again come back. Just wanted to share. How, how do you handle such situation? Uh, when you don't actually no. zone out. You z no, I mean, I'll tell you what my experience is, is that when I'm in that awareness, my intellect is actually much keener, much, uh, so it actually increases your intelligence. Um, and that is why intelligence is beautiful, because the more it is guided by awareness, so it's like the sun, you know, when the sun shines on water, which is your intellect and mind, so think of it like that, and the sun, the, your soul, your atma, the sun is shining on the water, and you know how it glimmers. Now, the more the clouds part and the sun shines, the more sunshine will start reflecting on the water. 
So your intelligence will keep increasing and increasing and increasing as the veil gets thinner, as the clouds start getting removed. So what I have noticed is my intellect is much sharper, much, uh, uh, and when intellect starts getting purified, your intuition increases, your intuitive in abilities increase. So it's not that I zone out, but I can see uh, not only the, the, that the intellect is working, but the intuition is much better as well. Um, so my, you start functioning way better than before. So it's not a, it's not a sort of a judgmental kind of situation. It's more about an understanding. Uh, so, you know, the mind is more available because what happens is otherwise our mind is constantly going, rrr, but when the, when the mind sort of calms down, you have more capacity to uh, into it so the it's not that the mind is very active when you are at work or talking to somebody when you have that awareness uh, more of the mind is available to you I, I don't experience zoning out actually no, zoning out in the sense um, how do you put it um, you are looking at people you know what they are saying. Uh -huh. but at the same time, uh, the same time you know, if someone says something, the impact that it, that it has on you is not the same impact. Yes, yes, absolutely. You are observing that impact, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. That's perfect. That's exactly, and exactly that is what you should be doing. That observation is called witnessing. So you see, oh, I reacted like this, or oh, this person said it, and this ha was the impact on it. So you're seeing sort of as a onlooker something that is happening as a reflection on a reflection. It's like something is reflecting on the water, and you're saying, oh, this reflected in in me. When this person said, you see that reflection in yourself, but you're observing it. Yes, 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 that's very good. I do that too, yes. I got very upset recently, you know. <laughs> so I was observing, oh, I'm really upset <laughs> by something. I mean, because this is new, uh, I wasn't sure, you know, if, uh, I mean, I obviously don't want to run the risk of coming across as someone, you know, as, as, you know are you not paying attention or, or are you not in this room or, see what I'm saying? That's not normally how people... No, then that's that's called dispassion. It's not that you're not paying attention. It's just that you're not involved. You're not so involved in it just from a mind level. You're gone above the mind, and you're simply observing it. So you're witnessing it. So it's very good. But I guess you close your eyes when you do it. No, I don't. No, 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 no. That's why I said being meditative, your eyes are wide open. <laughs> but he does that. He's like, whenever he wants to experience something, he'll be like, deep breath and close his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. But when he's at work, he's interacting with somebody, he's meditative. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can imagine walking around these yogis with their eyes closed at work. <laughs> <laughs> mm, so, so please read those uh, chapter six, okay? Because a lot of people uh, will ask you. You know, nowadays a lot of people are very interested in meditation and. You must know what is meditation according to Gita. Because most people know meditation according to uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Not according to Gita. So you must read this to understand. Because there are very few Upanad Upanishadic um, places. Like there is Kaivalya Upanishad. Which talks about... So in, in the Upanishads it's called Nididhyasanam. Okay, it's not called Dhyan. Med uh, med dhyan was first used in the Gita. So, Kaivalya Upanishad uh, is also talks about uh, 
nidhi dhyasana okay which is medit which is dhyan in in this thing meditation i don't know how meditation came about but meditation can imply anything it is not as precise as the vedic uh, words you know it's very very precise what is dhyan um <clears throat> so you know a lot of people confuse japa with dhyan and da 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 concentration no dhyan according to gita is the merger which is called samadhi in patanjali that merging into pure consciousness remember that when somebody asks you what is meditation or dhyan it is the merger into pure consciousness that's it so a lot of people do meditation you know it's simply calming the mind reducing thoughts feeling this 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 yeah you can call it meditation that's fine but don't call it dhyan dhyan is the merger into pure consciousness so nowadays meditation is becoming more popular but it's really a technique to lead you up to the merger it is not about the merger now a lot of this is about you know the guided meditation and all of that it's fine that's meditation you can call it meditation don't call it dhyan dhyan is different do you understand what i'm saying yeah so you should read it because you know we are, you're now you are now an ambassador for chapter 6 of the gita in the world as you have covered it so make sure you read it i had nothing else really to cover i've covered all the points that i wanted to um and and um yeah i mean there if you have any questions feel free you know just to email me or talk or whatever um there are many things about meditation and i was lucky to have spent of course uh many years with shri shri ravi shankar and that's where i was initiated into meditation i actually started meditating when i was a teenager um but i was initiated into meditation through the art of living i spent a week learning about vedic uh meditation through the head of chinmaya mission swami tejmayanand which he went through the kevalya upanishad the gita and many other texts talking about uh, meditation um uh, so forth so okay